I was going to say, all gens are great. <laughs> but the more important gen is going to tell us a little bit more about space and living and working in space and space garments. So thank you so much for coming. And um, I am delighted that you are going to be speaking and we're going to get to explore space for a little bit. Thanks. Yeah, well, um, just to kind of preface anything I'm going to say, um, you know, if you have questions, I've done, you know, a fair number of these Zoom meetings now, feel free to jump in on the chat and ask questions as I go. I do not have very many slides. I am an image person, so I try not to put a ton of text on my slides, but I'm happy to share the presentation afterwards. Um, with everybody if you want to utilize it in any way. Um, all of the images I used are freely available um, through NASA. So there's, you know, it, it's, it, there are a couple good tools which I did not include here, but I'd be happy to um, include on an email that can be circulated to all of you. And they're just uh, image websites that I use all the time to gather my materials for presentations like this. Um, in thinking about, and I'm going to click over to my presentation, um, let me share my screen with you, um, in kind of thinking about what it was you all would want to hear about and talking with Jen and, um, you know, knowing what you typically encounter in the museum space. Um, I decided to go with something that's actually, and, and curators do this all the time, so don't be surprised. Um, I wanted to use something that will make something, as I didn't already have something prepared, that would be something I could continue to use in the future. And one of the things that we're working on right now is part of transformation is a revision to an exhibition that is downtown right now. Um, so the Moving Beyond Earth exhibition is on the floor there. And that's kind of what this is based on. But let me backtrack a little bit and give you some, um, just a, a slight bit of information about me. Uh, I have been at the museum since the summer of 2002. Um, it's a, it's a long-term commitment for sure. We, it's a long-term relationship between me and this museum at this point. I started just fresh out of my master's program at uh, George Washington University in material culture. I started out at the very bottom rung of the curatorial ladder, which is a museum technician, and I've worked my way up finishing my PhD in 2014 at George Mason University and thus making myself eligible to finally be named a curator. And so um, making that transition now a few years ago, um, I've been responsible for artifacts and involved in exhibitions though since 2005. So just a few years into my experience, I started getting involved and my very first experience was actually working at the Yudhbar Hazi Center and helping to kind of organize what you see out there. So if you work in the space hangar, you'll know that it is organized in a very particular way. There's human space flight in one corner, rocketry in another corner, space science in the back left corner, and then application satellites in the back right corner, of course, always having featured a space shuttle in the middle. And so um, all of the exhibit cases that are in there uh, all of the uh, text I helped work coordinate the curators on. It is a big coordination process to get um, through, you know, submitting all of those things. And we do it in a much more rigorous and kind of technical way now than we used to. It used to be internal. We used to do all that work amongst curators and design staff. And now it's a little bit different where we're working with a contractor who's organizing all that material. So I don't have to do that work anymore, thank goodness, though I still do lots of the work I started out doing in 2002, strangely enough. Um, and that's because my position as I moved along did not get backfilled when I moved up. So a lot of the tasks I had back then, I still continue to have, um, which is fine until we hire somebody new and I can't wait till that happens, obviously. So, uh, but in just this last fall, so barely a year ago, I took over a new job as a curator. Um, I took, like I said, I took over some curatorial responsibilities starting in 2005. That was for our human spaceflight camera collection. That's what my dissertation and my book are based on. Um, and then in 2009, I acquired personal equipment. So um, when one of our curators retired, the spacesuit collection went over to Kathy Lewis. I took on all of the personal equipment items. So things like hygiene, food, 
communications devices, um, you know, just sort of the, the, I always say it's the things that make life real, the real life possible in space. So I'm the curator for watches, for toothbrushes, for food, or at least I was for that a collection. Um, up until this last fall when our um, space shuttle curator Valerie Neal retired. And so when that happened, um, I kind of transitioned yet again from dealing with things of the past to dealing with things of the present. And that aligns with my exhibit responsibility and my that responsibility is Moving Beyond Earth. If you've been in Moving Beyond Earth, you'll know it has to do with the last 40 years of human spaceflight. And we're now revising that to be more inclusive of the space station era and then that period going forward. And I think that framework of accessing space, living in space, space science or science in space, technology development and research, and then where are we going next? That the arc that we're going to do it at in the exhibit at home in space, which will open in mid 2025, that arc really explains, I think, a lot of the things that you're going to experience or get questions about. They're really nice, clean ways for me to be able to organize myself to talk to all of you that I've already done through that exhibit process. So like I said, the name of the exhibit is At Home in Space, but the larger themes are really what I'm getting at here. There's no obviously need to kind of think about specifically the exhibition element of it. But we've always framed this period as space flight since Apollo. I have curated collections going all the way back to the beginning. I'm still curator for our camera collection, for our astronaut chronograph collection. And sort of I have just de facto become the space food curator as well, although I don't really take responsibility for that older food. Uh, I've just spent a lot of time with these collections and you'll find with curators in particular, you may not find somebody to be the responsible person for it, the person who kind of has to take charge of it, but you'll know, you'll find people who have a history with dealing with these objects. And so um, many of us can speak to it. In fact, during last year's Apollo celebration, you could have interchangeably seen five, six, seven space history curators doing the same interviews on television, mostly because we've been doing this for a long time and we can all kind of work in each other's place because we know the content fairly well. So any of my colleagues could probably fill in and give you a similar talk. I just tend to give these talks because it focuses a little bit more on the personal side and that's where I've always focused is what makes spaceflight real for our visitors? What are the things that they identify with or can identify with and help to help them understand spaceflight in a uh, little bit easier way? Um, we often talk about spaceflight as a camping trip. It's similar to a camping trip, especially in terms of packing for a trip. Um, I'm the person that packs the suitcases when we go on vacations. I know how much stuff and how to arrange it in a suitcase in order to get it in my car and then how to arrange all those suitcases in the car so they all fit. Similar kinds of considerations go into space flight. And so that's true for the whole period, but that's kind of what I bring to the story when I'm thinking about how I want to relate space flight experience to our visitors. And so the places that we do that obviously are for the most part the space hangar and moving beyond Earth. Um, this is where we present that history, not only the history going all the way back to the beginning, but the last 40 years of human space flight. So a lot of those things look similar and that's because obviously we learned from the past to, to make new things in the future that includes the things that we use in space flight. So some of the techniques and technology has remained fairly consistent. We've just modernized, we've made it more efficient, we've found ways to do it better. Um, so with something like space food in particular, the packages have just gotten better. The ways in which we do our work have gotten easier and better for astronauts, obviously taking in mind all the things that we've learned in the past. Uh, and some of the equipment from especially this early period is still in use today. So one of the questions we get a lot about, obviously, because usually the Discovery Station includes the spacesuit um, in either location, people ask about, you know, what are these space like spacesuits? How do they work? What do they look like? Um, those spacesuits, other than the glove, the spacesuits largely are the same pieces of equipment that were designed and constructed for the very first astronauts back in the early 1980s when the first spacewalks were done. So 
you'll hear, you might remember the story from about a year ago when the astronaut on the screen, Anne McLean, did a, a spacewalk with another woman. And that was the first um, two female astronaut group going out and doing a spacewalk together. And many of the pieces and some, well, very specific pieces were often singled out to be noted as having been worn by a particular astronaut. So I can say that one of the spacesuits involved had the upper torso portion that had also been used by Kathy Sullivan on her first, you, when, when she made her first spacewalk as the first American woman to do one back in the early 80s. And so these largely are the same pieces of equipment that have existed. The gloves are what's really been modified and Kathy Lewis is our glove expert, but it's something that we talk about a lot because the hands are really where all the work has to happen. And so you can imagine an astronaut's hands need to be very tough. They need to have very strong muscles. They do lots of hand exercises. And the gloves are designed to make the, their job easier, not only to keep their hands warm, but to protect them from micrometeorites or other kinds of sharp things that could be out in on the um, outside of the space station. And so they need to obviously be very protective. But we talk about those things in both places and can talk about it very easily, obviously, in our discovery stations. But um, the exhibit itself, like I said, kind of covers this trajectory that really takes, I think, metaphorically takes us from the ground to space. And in the case of the exhibit, will take us all the way beyond Earth. So we've been stuck, stuck is probably not the right word, but we've been lingering in Earth orbit now for the last 40 years. And looking forward, it looks like we're going to go to other places again. So that's why um, we've taken the original name. I wanted to preserve a little bit of the old exhibition, keep that name moving beyond Earth and really use it for what it makes sense to use it for, which is talking about the future of human spaceflight. There will be an entirely different exhibit called Future of Space Flight that's going to ask similar things or talk about similar things with different questions involved. So um, that's, that's kind of a separate topic, but it involves a lot of the same things that you'll see in the end here. So I want to cover these and kind of address some of the things I know that you want to hear about. I'm going to try and get rid of my, um, or at least move my little screen here so I can see what I wrote. But um, I, like I said, use lots of images. And so this image is going to be something that those of you who um, make it downtown might see. I, I was told recently this is being sought out as a large graphic for the third floor uh, decorations that will go in um, when that space reopens for staff up there. And um, so that's kind of exciting. We'll have a nice, really beautiful view of discovery launching. And so this first section kind of covers um, accessing space a little bit differently than we have in the past. And so, um, you know, the space shuttle system, this, what we call the space transportation system was designed. It's an incredibly complex and very different type of, pro, uh, of program than had gone into space previously. The ideas of space planes had been around for an incredibly long time, but we wanna tell people in these exhibitions and through, you know, sort of what you're doing in discovery stations and as explainers and, um, and in all of our capacities about you know, why do we go to low Earth orbit? The space station will continue to be in low Earth orbit. It's been there for uh, 20 years. It's been occupied. It'll be 20 years in March. So we have continuous operation and occupation of the space station now for almost 20 years. But why are we living in low Earth orbit? What can we learn there? What are the things that um, are special about low Earth orbit that make it a great place to learn and to then find ways to develop ideas about going to other places. Um, but the space shuttle era is really marked by the orbiter and the development of the space transportation system. So this idea of having a space plane is really critical to that. People wanted to, you know, people thought that it would be much easier and much um, more practical in terms of capabilities to have something that looks like an airplane that can be flown back to earth and land on a runway, but also carry these incredible payloads into space. And so that's really what's special about the orbiter and sort of the overall big picture. Um, but the, the orbiter and the whole system are incredibly technically um, challenging the way that they were developed and they did go through refinement over time. And so that's something that we get kind of go through in the exhibition to then get to some of the big questions that people want to know about. Um, and that's what we get to sort of later in our um, talking about risks versus rewards 
and then where we've ended up now in accessing space because it definitely has changed in the last nine years um, the way you know with the retirement of the shuttle orbiter fleet you know where are we going to go and how are we going to do that and what's it going to look like and that's really i think what people want to know about today so you know like i said you know we we can do a lot of talking about the technical aspects of the shuttle orbiter the system itself but the thing that people often want to know about, and this is something that's, you know, really strangely for me, pivotal in my development as someone interested in spaceflight in particular, is that these two events, Challenger and Columbia, were happened at pretty um, interesting points in my life that then shaped what I ended up doing um, with my, you know, career in a way. I was, um, I was fairly young when Challenger was on the launch pad in January of 86. I was a third grader. I was the stereotypical student watching live on television at home as a teacher was launched into space for the first time. And, um, and it was not the first, she was not the first launching, being launched into space from a sort of non-astronaut career. There is a program that has existed or had existed for a few years before this and lasted afterwards as well. Um, called a, the, It was a spaceflight participant program um, called the Payload Specialist Program. And so people had been coming from the outside of the astronaut corps, from corporations and other countries to come and play a role in spaceflight and do this as a, as a non-career astronaut. And so the teacher program, the teacher in space program did something similar with obviously someone who was very much outside that zone. They were not in industry. They were not in a, a pilot. Um, she came from a very different background. So that we obviously made that unique, but it made it unique to viewing audiences at the time. And then um, the STS-107 mission was within my very first year at the museum. And I it was on a very short-term appointment, two-year appointment. I didn't know if it was even a place I would want to continue to work, but I think this, like the Challenger um, disaster, really shaped the way I thought about spaceflight and what I wanted to know about spaceflight. And I think that's similar. And it gives me a unique perspective on thinking about the shuttle era in particular is I had the same questions when these events happened that a lot of our visitors have. And so what I like to do is to talk first and foremost, not about the events themselves, though we can do that, but to talk about what the missions were about. And in this case, what I like to look at is the actual images of the crews. One story that is critical to the way we are moving forward in the museum in transformation is how is to talk about the people that are involved. It's easy to talk about technology. It's a very abstract, but very clear thing. Engineering is a very, I don't wanna say cold, but it is a very clear cut thing. Design of an engine is a very particular way. You can talk about it in a very technical way. You can talk about the orbiter in a very technical way. That's fine, but those things are all built by humans. And so to know that humans are involved, there are, you introduce obviously risk. And that's risk from the point of view of those using the technology, but at a risk also for the people who are developing the technologies. Um, they need to be aware of safety issues. And in the case of both of these instances, it was the failure primarily of management to listen to the engineers involved. And so there was this disconnect in both instances of engineers knowing that certain things were a significant problem and posed a significant risk to the vehicles, to the crews, and management pushing that aside in favor of pushing forward with the program itself. And so um, one of the things, like I said, about the humanization of that is to look at the management and engineers, the people who were involved in that decision making, but also to look at the crews themselves uh, to obviously remember and memorialize their uh, sacrifice for a human exploration of space but also to look at them actually as people and to realize, I think, something that um, we haven't done enough of in our exhibitions was to talk about, which is to talk about diversity. So, you know, from the very beginning of the space shuttle program, part of the goal was to make the space shuttle astronaut corps more diverse than it had ever been before. And that was through finding 
diverse faces. So people with different experiences, not only professionally, but personally, they came from different backgrounds and brought different points of view to the table in how to think about spaceflight differently. So with the uh, Challenger crew, you have a, a Jewish woman, you have an African-American man, you have um, another woman. Um, so you've got two women, which isn't, oh, sorry, I accidentally clicked on the wrong button. Um, you've got an Asian American. And so you've got this really diverse set of faces going into space, trying to achieve this mission and do something quite unique and in, in having Krista McAuliffe on that flight. Um, but you can see what they were wearing. So when we talk about Challenger in particular, we talk about the fact that astronauts of this time did not have adequate protection if there was a depressurization of their crew compartment. And while I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of the effects of the, um, the, the explosion on the solid rocket booster and then what then, how that then cascaded into affecting the crew compartment, it's a little bit beyond um, what I like to talk about in this kind of setting, but you can certainly feel free to go and explore that. Wikipedia will explain it quite well. Um, but you can see they were wearing basically flight suits and very simple helmets. And those helmets had a hose that basically made sure that it supplied oxygen, but they were wearing very simple uniforms. They were not wearing pressure suits, partial pressure suits, anything of the sort. And that was the fundamental change in how the crew itself would be protected going forward. So on the very next missions, they had a suit, which we show in uh, the downtown exhibition, which is what we call the pumpkin suit. Um, but it's a suit only worn during launch and re-entry in order to make sure that the crew had some form of protection. Now, that did not protect the crew of Columbia, unfortunately. Columbia's um, status was much different uh, in terms of the accident. They actually fulfilled their entire mission. They had an incredibly successful science research mission. This was one of the only missions of uh, the decades um, of the 2000s that was specifically a science mission. It was, I think, and it had long delayed in part because of the space station construction. The goal was really to finish the space station. And this was purely science. So it was going to an orbit that was much different uh, than the space station. It would only have its payload bay doors open towards the earth in order to perform certain experiments. And it was so, it was the profile of the mission was very different. But you can see by looking at the pictures, there's a very similar crew composition here. You have two women, you have an African-American man, you have um, an Israeli astronaut. Um, Ilan Ramon was a pilot in the Israeli military and was on this mission as part of the payload specialist program. And so the faces of these people are, uh, you know, important to keep in mind and their backgrounds. And Kalpana Chawla, I would mention too, is somebody who's um, important to our story now in the museum, as is Doug Brown. They're the two on the left in the picture. We actually have collections from them personally. Their families, after um, many years after the missions, wanted to donate some of the collection of their of their family members to the museum and so we have a really substantial collection from each of those astronauts which is really quite special um, that we can represent them that way and we have worked on ways to represent the challenger crew as well so representation of these people as people is important to what we do not just talking about the vehicles but you can kind of see my summaries on the right of the way in which we can talk about some of the more technical aspects of that. So I try to balance out the technical with the personal and talking about um, the fact that the space, sh space shuttle crews were very, very much um, diverse groups of people. And these are just two examples because we use them as examples of the failures, um, but also you know, we can use them as examples of the changes and the changing nature of the astronaut core. But on the technical side of it, of course, we always talk about the orbiters. And so why did the orbiters get retired? Why did the space shuttle program end? Why did it need to end? Well, a big part of that, of course, was because of the loss of Columbia. And I can see I accidentally did not italicize Columbia here. Shame on me and my editorial skills. Um, we always obviously like boats, uh, ships with formal names. We always italicize the names of the orbiters. And so um, the loss of Columbia, Columbia, though, necessitated a change in NASA's plan. They needed to complete the space station, and that became 
the overriding goal. Now, there was one exception to that in terms of mission profiles after the return to flight, and that would be the mission of STS-125 to service the Hubble Space Telescope. Obviously, Hubble is an incredible uh, source of knowledge and um, that there was a, a huge push, not, not um, a small one from a political angle as well. Barbara Mikulski, the um, longtime lover of Hubble and representative in Maryland, made sure that you know, NASA was going to save Hubble and make one last attempt to keep it working. And so that mission is particularly significant to the museum as well. And you obviously will see lots of Hubble artifacts in the museum. So we, 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 we make that point um, that, you know, Hubble was saved in part because NASA's willingness to get the orbiters back up, flying again, um, update, you know, their, the way in which they proceeded through the next, um, let's see, return to flight in 2005. So they had six years in which to complete the International Space Station and perform that one last servicing of Hubble in 2009. But it was all based, that return to flight was all based on the findings of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board and how they felt things needed to operate. There needed to be certain plans. There needed to be a way to fix any tile damage that might have happened during launch once the shuttle orbiters were in orbit. So they developed ways to inspect the shuttle tiles, go all the way underneath the vehicle itself to scan with lasers and cameras and find out if there was any significant damage that could potentially harm the vehicle during the re-entry. So they, they did all of that. They had a plan for rescue, which meant putting another, uh, another orbiter, uh, another entire launch system on the other launch pad. Um, there are some beautiful photos of that where you can see two vehicles on the um, launch pads in, in Florida at the same time. But of course the program wraps up in, in 2011. And by that time, um, of the last mission, STS-135, NASA had already made its decision on what to do with the vehicles themselves. So once they had obviously made the decision to end the program of this very complex vehicle and this complex system, there needed to be a decision about what to do with everything. And that's a great story that we tell at the museum all the time about how Discovery landed out at Dulles. Uh, any of you who are around for that in 2012 will know that it was an incredible event, very exciting um, and life-changing for somebody like me, who's now the shuttle curator, which is very, you know, it's, it really brings it home in that I, as a college student, watched John Glenn on television launch on Discovery, and then I get to be the curator of that same vehicle now. Um, so it makes it, you know, kind of come home in a way. Um, but those, those uh, final locations were announced in April 2011, and, and you can see where they are now in their configurations. Um, the note I will say about Endeavor is that the plan, long-term plan for it has always been to put it in a vertical orientation, reassembled with solid rocket boosters and an external tank. They have not done very well with funding that project in California. Um, it's a $250 million project and they've not made hardly a dent in that, sadly, after all these years. And so it's not clear that that will ever happen. And you can see that it's in a very temporary looking building, unlike Atlantis and Discovery. Um, Endeavor's building is very much like what um, Enterprise is in up on the deck of the Intrepid in New York City. So um, some different, you know, different results to all of this, but largely, you know, there's a a small, obviously, somewhat small subset of curators here around the country who can talk to each other. And um, we've got a few people who are really great resources who deal with the vehicles in their present state across all of the locations. And so we have a nice kind of group where we can see, you know, hey, is there anything going on with these vehicles? Because they're so complex, things are just going to continue to happen um, to them over time and systems had to be removed in order to put them on display. So let's keep an eye on them and obviously um, protect them for generation, gen generations to come. And that's really you know, our role as a museum. Many of you obviously will get questions about living in space. We know from our surveys at the museum of our visitors, the number one thing people wanna know is what's it like to be in space. Uh, when they come into an exhibition or into the space hangar, they want to they get, get a real visceral sense of that because it's such a rare experience. Um, less than 600 people have ever gone into space. So how do we represent their experience to people who probably 
um, odds on will never be able to do this themselves. And so we want to tell them in this, in the new version of the exhibition, we want to talk about the goal here, which for the last 40 years has been to create a permanent human presence in space. And that was really achieved through the International Space Station Program. And so we, we get at the ideas about how do you build a space station and all of the ways in which we built up to that over the years. It wasn't just just a one-off, we build the space station. We learned a lot over time. We learned through going up on Skylab. We learned through the Russian experiences with their space station Mir and how to build things that were modular and then move them around. In the picture here on the left, you see the delivery of Destiny. And Destiny is a huge part of this, not only the space station story, but of the story of this exhibition because in our exhibit, we will have a very faithful recreation of destiny as the U.S. National Lab, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But um, the lab itself is the place where the science happens, at least in terms of, of a U.S. context, and there are lots of science applications in the station that I'll mention. But, um, you know, building it is a process. It's an international program. There are 15 partners who go into this um, program, and you can see I included an, uh, an image of astronaut Tim Peake here, and you can see his um, Union Jack uh, very visible on his shoulder there. Um, it is a very complex, probably the most complex engineering um, accomplishment of in human history. And it's done in space and it's done by spacewalking individuals. And so we need to talk about, again, who are those people uh, who are building that that place, who are living there, who are working there. What is it like for them in space? What's it like to live in space? What are the effects on the human body? How do we learn about the effects on the effects of a low gravity environment? We don't usually say zero gravity. I should say that as well. Zero gravity literally is zero, but space is not zero. Um, a low Earth orbit is not zero. There is, we call it a microgravity environment because there is still some effect of gravity. Um, otherwise the space station would be able to kind of leave Earth's um, orbit. It's held here uh, by Earth's gravity, so there is some effect. Um, but we want to measure what are those differences, and you can do that and do it for very specific purposes by studying the human body. And then, of course, it takes spacewalking, it takes EVA, extravehicular activity, in order to construct and maintain the station. And so this is really, you know, the sort of primary goal of dividing up. I mean, we have right now in Moving Beyond Earth, a unit called Living and Working, and it's all sort of a very condensed version of this, but we wanted to split those apart for our new version of the exhibit to be able to talk about the work separately because you have to first account for the human in this. You have to make a vehicle, you have to have modules, you have to have systems that are gonna support human life. And so what does that mean? You have to have appropriate nutrition. You need to be able to have food that is going to supply the right number of calories. Now in the environment of the space station or of a vehicle in space, digestion works differently. The food, because you are floating, the food is going to float through your system as well. So astronauts often talk about how they're not, they don't feel hungry the same way we feel here on Earth, because the gravity is gonna pull all of your food down into the bottom of your stomach. Well, in space, you feel full faster because the food is floating. And so they have to really take account for all of the food they're eating. And that's one of the things that's very noticeable is that the big difference about astronauts living on the ground versus living in space is how much they have to write down and record and follow according to a schedule. It is all very rigorous, very planned. Um, they have regular meetings with doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists. They have phone calls home with their families. They need to maintain as best they can because they're in an isolated environment, they need to maintain some sense of themselves and that includes the sense of you know their physical state so they need to eat a certain amount of food they can't just skip meals because they feel full they have to eat the food in order to maintain it most of them lose muscle mass over the course of this we also know that exercise is critical to this they have to maintain muscle mass as best they can and so you'll usually hear um, quoted about two to two and a half hours of exercise a day they do that using a few different machines there is um and you I can, i'll 
flick quickly to the next slide because this is where you really see some of the different topics I know you all want to know about. Um, you can see in the middle here astronaut Sonny Williams exercising on what we don't call a bicycle but an ergometer because it does have measuring capabilities. In fact, they've used the, or the ergometer for lots of different studies even using special equipment that the astronauts wear. Um, but um, you can see here she's um, actually she's part of a, a race, a competition. So there is this always this effort to connect some of what astronauts are doing to what's happening on the ground. Sonny Williams is known for also having used the treadmill in the International Space Station to also run the Boston Marathon at the same time as the actual marathon runners. And so she used that treadmill. So you have an ergometer, you have a treadmill, and then there is also a machine called A-RED, A-R-E-D, which is a weightlifting machine. A-RED and the treadmill are both near the cupola. The ergometer is inside Destiny because it is also often used for research purposes. It's stationed here. You can see an ergometer in Moving Beyond Earth. It is our shuttle ergometer um, that was used in the space shuttle orbiters. Very similar to this, just slightly smaller um, and um, but it's a really, really critical feature of, um, of, you know, life in space is having enough exercises to, exercise devices to be able to, to, you know, keep track of things, keep your muscle tone, um, and to keep your heart moving because your heart doesn't have to work as hard either. So you need to get that blood pumping somehow, and they do that through um, these experiences. So you can see it's attached to the wall. Um, it's also, it's got this special attachment device that makes sure that the vibrations that are created by the movement of the pedals do not affect the actual space station. So it's secured, the astronaut can use it very similarly to how they would bicycle at home, but it's not going to, all that movement isn't going to cause any, um, any problems for the vehicle. It's not gonna give up that, it's not gonna pass that vibration along. So it's a bit isolated in a very interesting way. Um, I meant, mentioned food. So astronauts do in fact get fresh food and the effort to include fresh food for astronauts is an increasing source of interest. Um, the image that I had on the last page of the astronauts looking at the veggie experiment, which is inside the Columbus module. Um, that's a, you know, a big project to really learn how we can grow our own foods in space. But the resupply missions are critical to the astronauts' welfare. These missions fly from Wallops Island. They fly from uh, the Kennedy Space Center, and they, they bring up supplies. And so on a regular basis, astronauts are getting fresh foods, apples, oranges, things that will last. Um, one astronaut I heard recently said his, his dream would be to make it possible to have bananas. Bananas, because of the way they have to store the foods in advance of the missions, the launches, bananas tend to be the hardest to do because as you all know from putting bananas in your, um, in your kitchen, they, they ripen very quickly and there's not enough time there to prepare a banana and have it in the, in the, in the uh, launch vehicle and then make it to space without it having been completely rotted. So, um, so that they haven't figured that one out yet, but um, obviously other than fresh foods, they have tons of packaged foods. Many of the foods are what we call thermostabilized. The way I like to explain that to people is very simple. If you walk down nearly any row at a grocery store now, any aisle is going to have a thermostabilized food of some kind in it. So when you pick up not a can of tuna, but a packet of tuna, that tuna has been thermal stabilized. If you buy milk off a shelf rather than cold milk out of a refrigerator, you're buying thermal stabilized milk. And that means that it has been packaged in a way that allows it to stay shelf stable for a very long time. Astronauts use that food quite frequently. That's how they get things like very complex meals that are beef teriyaki and tofu and garlic sauce and um, the kinds of things we would think of as an entree basically. And they can put those in an oven to warm them up so they actually taste a little bit more like what you and I would expect to have on our dinner plate. And there's lots of dehydrated foods still, dehydrated drinks in particular. Um, favorites include, of course, things like coffee. And 
SUNY Williams was known, very well known for enjoying fluff, which would make her a really good partner in crime with my son, who is seven. He loves fluff, so, so did she. And fluff is just the right texture, apparently, to be taken into space. It doesn't, it doesn't ooze out. It has to be smeared onto things. And so that consistency of something like peanut butter, which can be taken as well, those kinds of materials can be taken fairly easily. Seasonings are really important. Hot sauce is often is often on the um, um, uh, on the table, so to speak. And there is literally a table here next to Karen Nyberg to the right there. That's their dinner table. Um, so you, they have lots of different options available to them. Um, very much like what you would have on Earth. It's just packaged very differently and eaten very differently, obviously. Um, how does it affect their bodies? So I mentioned the exercise, that's a critical feature of how they keep themselves healthy. But what you can see in the bottom left picture is astronaut Terry Vertz. He's wearing um, one of the Russian penguin suits, which is similar to the one that we have on display from Sharon, Shannon Lucid. This helps their bodies prepare for re-entry. So after an astronaut has been in space for a long time, their body has very much adjusted to the life in space, but to prepare them for what it's like to be back on Earth, they wear these specially designed suits to get them ready for that. The Russians obviously, when a vehicle lands, very carefully pluck and carry the astronauts out of the spacecraft, out of the Soyuz, um, because they are fairly weak. They, their bone density has decreased. Their muscle mass has sometimes decreased. They've often lost a lot of weight. Somewhere between 10 and you know, 20 pounds is not unusual for an astronaut. Um, they, you know, their, their hearts aren't used to the gravity. Their ears haven't adjusted. Ears are a really big part of this. So um, if you've ever gotten water in your ear, you'll know that it can be very disorienting. I had it happen to me just a few weeks ago. I went swimming in a lake. I had water in my ear. And even four or five hours later, I felt dizzy because the water was affecting the way my eardrum and the inner ear canal and all those things work together to keep your balance. And so balance, regaining balance is a really big part of this. So it does take them some time to readjust. Um, there is a really wonderful graphic, and I didn't bring it in here, but there is a wonderful graphic that covers this in Moving Beyond Earth. It is right on the outside of our Discovery mid-deck mock-up, and it's astronaut Drew Foistel, and it has basically a big swath of all of the effects that the body has, you know, that are basically changes to the human body in space, and I can't really go through those all right now, but um, I kind of tried to summarize some of the things that are really critical. Um, we're also finding out through research that there are definite effects uh, on the eyes. Um, there are changes to the shape of the eye while in space. There's also a lengthening of the spine. There's no gravity to compress your spine, so you actually grow in space. That almost immediately changes when you land, um, so you don't get to keep the extra two inches you might get, uh, gain by going to space. And um, I just lost my train of thought, but you know, the, the effects are, are pretty noticeable. And one of the people I would mention, if you're really interested in exploring this further, um, the person who probably has the most knowledge of this, at least from a very technical research point of view, is Scott Kelly. His, um, his autobiography uh, endeavor is, is really fascinating and tells you a lot about some of the things that they have to worry about in space in terms of um, carbon dioxide and recycling water and things like that. Just having enough water is a big thing. What do the astronauts do for fun? Um, the really wonderful thing I think is great about learning about astronauts in space is how much they really do love their downtime. They are scheduled six and a half days per week. They get basically one half day off per week. All the rest of the time is spent 50% of it on research. Because of a 2012 law that Congress passed, US astronauts are required to spend 50% of their time in space on science research as part of the US National Lab program. What's the other 50% spent on? Big part of that is spent on their own health and maintenance of their bodies, but also the maintenance of, on the space station. They have to clean up after themselves. They have to wipe down all the surfaces with antibacterial wipes. So this has been a really great experience for microbiologists and great preparation in knowing what happens on the space station to think about our own environments on Earth during the pandemic. So you notice a lot at the beginning of the pandemic talking about how astronauts experience isolation. Here you go. This is really where it comes to comes to reality, you know, comes true is you see even astronauts need their downtime, though. They don't want to be spending all their time on work. 
Um, so they get time to do things like watch movies. So the astronauts here in this picture have set up, um, and it's, I, I think, a, a temporary thing that they've rigged together, um, is basically a flat white surface, probably some kind of piece of fabric, that then on, onto which they can project movies. And so in this particular instance, they were watching the movie The Martian, um, and they've also been given access to the latest Star Wars movies, but they usually get the latest features, especially if they're space related and they can request those. They have personal computers inside their sleep compartments so they can have sent to them via um, transmission from Earth from Houston. They can get their favorite TV shows uploaded. Um, one of their absolute favorite things to do in their downtime though is, and it's not always downtime, it's sometimes work time, is, is what um, Christina Cook is doing here in the bottom right hand picture and that's taking pictures of space. So they spend a lot of time looking out the windows, just like if you were on a car ride, your kids probably tend to spend a lot of time looking out the windows um, and they can play some pretty great games of I Spy, I would imagine. So, um, but they cannot spy with the naked eye, the uh, Great Wall of China, so. Um, but it's, um, they, they, there are plenty of ways they can keep themselves busy, but their, their downtime is pretty limited. They do usually have, um, you know, a set sleep period as well, like all astronauts have always had, so they're in their sleep compartments. They also have regularly scheduled, they have daily access to phone calls to go home. They have a weekly video call usually with their families. They do have access to internet phones. So um, there are some I have met who have received direct phone calls, not direct, it's direct through Houston, but phone calls from the International Space Station. And we've done those links in the museum as well. So you know that it's not impossible to communicate with them while they're up there. Science and space though, um, for me, not so much, it's not so much the story of what does it feel like to be in space, it's what the heck are they doing up there? That was the big question I used to hear from educational staff members docents, um, explainers, ed or educator staff, people want to know what the heck are they doing up there. If they're spending 50% of their time on science, what does it look like? I get lots of questions about this all the time, especially from the docents. They want to know what's happening up there. There are literally tens of thousands of reports on science experiments that have happened up there. So me, for me to summarize all that is incredibly difficult and to tell you what we've learned is incredibly difficult partly because I'm not a scientist or a doctor, medical doctor that is. Um, so it's hard for me to summarize that and explain what we've learned. But what I can say is they're doing a really huge variety of stuff. Often in the microgravity science glove box, they're putting materials in a glove box like we would do in a science lab here on earth, putting things in an isolated environment to study them. They're doing life sciences. There are often um, small mammals and other types of animals in space that they will study. Um, to be blunt, yes, indeed, they do kill them. They dissect them. That is not something many people are comfortable with. So we have often kind of glazed over that fact that we do animal research in space. Um, but there uh, is lots of research going on right now in microbiology. They want to study the microbiome. They want to know how to manage astronaut health, cleaning up, things like that. They need to understand human factors. What happens to DNA? There are changes now, as Scott Kelly would tell you, there have been changes apparently to his DNA because of his flight in space. And so how does that work? They study each other. So you often see astronauts kind of experimenting on each other and drawing each other's blood and doing all this um, very interesting human factors type experience, experiments. Um, there are materials research. How do materials behave? How do fluids behave in space? There are incredible studies um, that then impact some of the technology research that goes on that has to do with the materials in particular. And so um, most of this, I should say, is meant to be steered towards the future. What is it we can learn in space, in low Earth orbit, in the unique special environment that we are presented with being able to access? What can we learn there that will make it easier for us to go farther? A big one I don't mention here is research on radiation. How is the human body affected by cosmic, solar, and other kinds of radiation that bombard the station all the time? The station resides inside the magnetic field of the Earth. If astronauts are gonna to go to the moon and Mars, they'll be outside of that. They won't have that protection. And so what radiation dosages are these astronauts being exposed to? And how do we protect astronauts who go outside the Van Allen belts to go to the moon and Mars? We have limited experience with that, limited knowledge, limited data. 
So let's gather what we can while we're in Earth orbit and prepare the, for the future. And that's where the technology comes into play. We need to develop technologies that are going to allow us to make life in long-term life in space easier. So we need to know better how to better move through through space? What are some of the types of control mechanisms that we need? <clears throat> One of the most famous experiments, technology experiments that's been um, in the, for a very long time been on the station is what's called spheres. And you see that here with Drew Morgan in the upper left picture. And I made it very large because spheres is something that is coming to the museum. When those return from space, those will come to the museum and be on display in at home in space. So it's super exciting or I'm personally hoping, hoping for the blue one. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but Spheres is, is inspired by something I'm a really big fan of, which is Star Wars. Um, so this is a good crossover of engineers being interested in what Hollywood creates and thinking of ways you could actually use that in space. And so if you know the movies, you'll know the Jedi use these training balls that float and do certain things and can shoot little lasers. Well, how would you control something like that in space, in a microgravity environment? What kind of um, little tiny devices, little tiny rockets, so to speak, would you need to control that? How would you control and understand how the fluids move around inside that? And what could you use it for? Um, in the case of these, they're looking to use them kind of like personal assistance. So maybe you could have one of these spheres go off and fetch something for you. Um, they could be, you know, something that you would speak to and it could record things for you and then go and plug in and download that and act as a personal assistant. And we're looking to use robots that way. How can they assist us to take over some of the tougher duties? How are we going to sustain human life going forward? Um, how can we create our own food? How can we grow our own food? How can we bake in space? Something that you might have heard about this last year. We'll be getting one of the cookies that was baked in space for this exhibit too. Um, so, you know, how can we, you know, kind of create those things using materials sent in advance? How can we make it a bit more lifelike, literally lifelike, um, to live in space for a long duration? But one of the key parts of this that then kind of, you know, has a technological gap that we need to overcome is actually communicating. Um, how do we talk to people who are at the distance of Mars because of the great distance that is between uh, Earth and Mars? How can we make that a more manageable system? And thinking about how we get there and how long it takes to get there, how do we manage the fact that these astronauts will not have the advantage of instantaneous or near instantaneous communication with Earth. If they have a problem, how do they manage it? The Martian, to be perfectly honest, it really deals with that question and that problem in a very, very good way. They obviously had already performed the task of retrieving the astronaut before anybody on Earth knew about it. It already happened by the time the signal made it back. And so um, it's, a, it's a pretty serious problem and, and that makes NASA very, very nervous because they like to know what's happening every single moment of the day. Um, and just to wrap up, where are we going next? Um, I'm 100% sure people want to know what's not only happening today, but what's going to happen tomorrow and next year and in five years when this gallery opens. And that's a huge challenge because um, as far as I know, we have not invented a crystal ball that works or a magic eight ball that is reliable every time. So I cannot tell you necessarily if Artemis 1, which you see on the left, is actually going to fly next year like they promise. But um, there have been commitments put on the board for astronauts to go back to the moon in the next, um, in the next few years. And so um, it is, uh, a challenging unit to try to get across to people. Um, what is it gonna look like and how do we address that in an exhibit sense in, in, in years before it's actually even going to be open? I, I have a really tough time figuring out uh, and balancing how do we talk about it, write about it today, and then update it at some future point so that what people come into the museum and see is accurate. Um, it, there's, no, there's no easy way to do this in a museum setting, but we want to talk about those destinations. Are we going to go to the moon? Are we going to go to Mars? Perhaps by the time this exhibit opens, that will all be, not all be answered, but some of it will be answered. Presumably the Artemis One mission, which I pulled this graphic off of NASA's website. It's a great mission profile description. And because the Artemis One capsule, so that silver part at the top of the um, 
picture in on the left there, because Artemis One has been committed to this exhibit, when it opens in 2025, you will be able to go and see the first Artemis vehicle to have gone to the moon and back. It won't have carried people, but at least until Artemis Two is com its mission is complete, and that will be over multiple missions. Artemis Two will fly multiple missions um, until Artemis Two is retired from flight you'll be able to see Artemis One in the museum, which will be very exciting. And so that's a, um, that's a internal museum knowledge kind of thing um, we do, but we do have the agreement of NASA to proceed with planning for that to happen in 2025. So um, it's obviously very exciting for us and we'll get to explain, you know, obviously how Artemis is different than Apollo, um, what these missions could look like. We'll want, and it's done a lot through models. Um, what kind of landers will we be using? What kind of habitats could we create on the moon? And uh, how, does this, how does this look different than what we've done before? So not only does the spacecraft kind of look like an Apollo spacecraft, the people who are performing it and producing all this stuff are kind of the same people to some degree. Lockheed Martin is making Orion. However, the lander that was just delivered to NASA this week was built by Blue Origin. So we need to teach um, in these exhibits how that, that relationship has changed in the last decade, couple of decades, how it's more commercial than it was before. And that leads us then to talk about an entirely new exhibit, which is future of space flight. And I don't wanna get too much into that, but, um, but you can see that I think that we've, I've tried to at least cover some of what is going on, but I will say um, it, is, it is probably the hardest question you'll have, not the, the, the questions that came before that I tried to address, but these questions of what's next, what lessons are we learning for, it, for the future? You, you can, people can ask the questions a lot. There aren't really solid answers to them because we haven't done it yet. Um, and that's the challenge of working in a sort of historical museum is we're talking about something, things that have already happened, but people really want to know what's happening today. And so refreshing this exhibit is a topic of conversation. How do we keep it current? How do we update it in the future when things change? We've tried to do that with our exhibits in the past and we probably need a better way of doing that. But hopefully through these kinds of presentations and your presence on the floor, we'll be able to give people some of the latest information. We can always have recommendations about where people can go to find more information that's current. Um, so I'm kind of like breezing through the chat a little bit to see if there's any particular questions. Um, I will answer Annie's question. Do I have a favorite artifact? Um, absolutely. Uh, and it's gonna sound weird maybe, but I'll tell you why it's my favorite artifact. I just wrote about this for the museum itself. Um, one of my favorite artifacts is the IMAX camera that's on display in Moving Beyond Earth. It's not because it's a camera, it's because of the way it was constructed. I come from Michigan. My father is a tool and die maker. He's owned his own company since the early 80s. And I've always had a strange appreciation for machining of metal, <laughs> which sounds a little weird. But when I look at the IMAX camera, um, I, I what I see is... Um, a, a really beautifully machined piece of equipment. And I absolutely love it for that. So it is um, probably by far one of my favorite things. So um, I, I, had a, I had a question for you, sort of to like sure. sum up this whole thing. Um, one thing that I anticipate the volunteer or the visitors are gonna be even more interested in right now is the why. Why should we have human space flight? Ah. How does it help us? And I was hoping that could be our final question. For sure. Your perspective. And yes. So I will give you, I think, what is the most reasonable explanation of that. It just so happens to be also NASA's explanation of that. So why do we go into space? Because the space environment, the microgravity environment in particular, offers opportunities to learn new things that can be used not only to stay in space, stay in space longer to protect people, but also then to be turned around and used on Earth. Without the effects of gravity, there are things that we can understand, we have come to understand about how we develop and use certain types of tools, how certain kinds of things happen, certain biological and other processes that then can influence the way in which things are done on Earth. So one example of that that I am getting ready to acquire as a curator is a new type of solar cell. 
So solar power is hugely important to how the space station works. You know, the solar panels are iconic on that, but we want to make those more efficient. And it's not just that they could be more efficient in space. The types of those the materials that they're made from, the way they're constructed, if they work really well in space, they have a great potential to also work really well on the ground, considering we also have an atmosphere that needs to be penetrated by that solar radiation and that solar power that we can then gather for electrical use. Um, that's, you know, that's a great example that we'll use in the exhibit of how a very specific technology developed, tested in space outside the space station could then be turned around, brought back to Earth, and then utilized for our own purposes. There are probably thousands of examples of that same thing, but that's why I think we continue to support the space station program is in particular. This is all very invisible type stuff. Like I said, you can go online and do research to your heart's content about all of the different medical and scientific experiments that are done up there that are then being you know, leveraged to do things differently on Earth. Um, but it could take me you know, days and weeks to go through that and try and digest it and then be able to regurgitate it to all you. But if you're interested in something like cancer and research on cancer, I guarantee you they're doing cancer research in space and how microgravity maybe could affect the way in which we make cancer drugs um, differently, or if, could we make them in space in a more, in a better, more effective formulation that then could be brought back? You know, there are lots of possibilities that we just haven't explored yet. And that's why so many experiments are done is because people have these great ideas and anybody can be part of this now. You can have students from fifth grade on basically sending experiments to the space station to try and answer some of the great questions we have. And so, um, it's it, the space station itself is that's why it's such a big part of our story now is um, it is this location where we can really it can facilitate our learning about not only space but then kind of be turned back around to benefit all of us on earth. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming today and I, I feel both inspired and informed. <laughs> Good. I'm glad I achieved at least my mission goals today. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. Thank everybody um, for coming. And thank you again, Jennifer, for presenting to us and sharing your wonderful knowledge. <laughs> no problem. All right. Good day, y'all. <laughs> Bye-bye. And you got lots of thank yous in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I saw that. If you guys want the presentation, just let me know. I can email it to you. Oh, thank you. Um, and the last thing is, oh, okay. <laughs>